Hello everyone, it's Pastor Cynthia from Elkins Park Presbyterian Church, continuing our Bible study through the book of Ezekiel. We are now up to chapters 9 and 10. There are several previous lesson videos that have been posted on our YouTube, Facebook, and church website, eppchurch.org, if you'd like to catch up. Also, feel free to share these videos and the lesson guides I've been emailing out with anyone you would like. I hope you are doing well and staying connected with friends, family, neighbors, and your church family at this time, although we are physically separate from one another. If you have any questions or concerns or prayer requests, please reach out to me at church, 215-887-2544. As we turn to the book of Ezekiel again today, please join me in prayer. God, we are amazed by the beauty of your creation by how spring is just coming alive around us, how the birds are singing, and also how the flowers are beginning to bloom. Lord, we thank you for the warmth, for the spring rain, for the realities, Lord, that your world is ever moving forward, filled with hope and rebirth. Lord, we look forward in hope to an opportunity to truly celebrate your creation, to celebrate the newness around us and the life that you offer. Lord, guide us as we work through scripture this day. Guide us in our daily lives. Protect us, keep us well. And Lord, give us the hope found in you and the knowledge we need that one day we will all be reunited. We ask this all giving thanks in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. So now we turn to Ezekiel on chapter 9. Up until now, Ezekiel's been having amazing, supernatural, glory-filled visions, or theophanies, direct encounters with God, where he receives messages about what is happening back in the homeland, the land of Israel, as the Babylonians continue to lay siege on Jerusalem, where Jeremiah the prophet and a small remnant of the Israelites still remain. But Ezekiel, now several years into the exile, is in Babylon, a priest, a leader. He's already been captured and seen as valuable to the Babylonians. And now God has called him to share these messages with God's people as they are in a foreign land being ruled over by a pagan society. We continue now in chapter 9 of Ezekiel. Then I heard him call out in a loud voice, bring the guards of the city here, each with a weapon in his hand. And I saw six men coming from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. With them was a man clothed in linen who had a writing kit on his side. They came in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the God of Israel went up from above the cherubim where it had been and moved to the threshold of the temple. Then the Lord called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing kit at his side and said to him, Go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all of the detestable things that are done in it. And I listened. He said to the others, follow him through the city and kill without showing pity or compassion. Slaughter old men, young men and maidens, women and children, but do not touch anyone who has the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were in front of the temple. So in this vision, God shows Ezekiel, thankfully a vision, not what really happened, but a vision that those who are sinning, those who have purposely broken the covenant, who have purposely and knowingly turned away from God towards false idols, they will be punished. They will have the blessings of safety removed from them. But those who repent, those who are lamenting and remorseful, saddened by their sin of idolatry and false worship, those who want to return to God, will somehow be marked and God will recognize them and spare them. Similar to how in the Exodus, right before the people left Egypt and were freed from slavery, they put lamb's blood over their doors so the spirit of death would pass over them and save them. In this vision, there's this mark on the foreheads of those who remain faithful, preventing them from enduring the punishment that they are due for their sin. We continue in verse 7. Then God said to them, defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain, go. So they went out and began killing throughout the city. While they were killing and I was left alone, 
I fell face down crying. Ah, sovereign Lord, you are going to destroy the entire remnant of Israel in this outpouring of your wrath on Jerusalem. God answered me, the sin of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of bloodshed and the city is full of injustice. They say, the Lord has forsaken the land. The Lord does not see. So I will not look on them with pity or spare them, but I will bring them down on their own heads what they have done. Then the man in linen with the writing kit at his side brought back word saying, I have done as you commanded. So chapter nine is this amazing vision that God gives Ezekiel of how there will be hope. All is not lost. The majority of people have sinned, turning from God, breaking the covenant, worshiping false idols. But thankfully, a small remnant in Jerusalem, a small group of people still understand that their sin is wrong, that they're called to worship God alone. And since they are mourning what they have done, regretting what they have done, seeking to repent, turn from their sin and towards God, God promises to Ezekiel in this vision that those who desire to be faithful will be saved from the punishment and given the opportunity to turn back to God, away from their sin, and back into covenantal right relationship with God. So there is a message of hope here in the midst of all of this disaster. We now continue in chapter 10. I looked and I saw the likeness of a throne of sapphire above the expanse that was over the heads of the cherubim. The Lord said to the man clothed in linen, Go in among the wheels beneath the cherubim, fill your hands with burning coals from among the cherubim, and scatter them over the city. And as I watched, he went in. Now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the temple when the man went in, and a cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord rose from above the cherubim and moved to the threshold of the temple. The cloud filled the temple, and the court was full of the radiance of the glory of the Lord. The sound of the wings of the cherubim could be heard as far away as the outer court, like the voice of God Almighty when he speaks. When the Lord commanded the man in linen, take fire from among the wheels, from among the cherubim, the man went in and stood beside the wheel. Then one of the cherubim reached out his hand to the fire that was among them. He took up some of it and put it in the hands of the man in the linen, who took it and went out. Under the wings of the cherubim, could be seen what looked like the hands of a man. So this vision should sound a lot like the vision in Ezekiel chapter one, where there was the wheel turning within the other wheel, the glory of God bright and burning like a fire, and all of these winged creatures. Now, again, in this full glory of God, in this supernatural revelation, this vision beyond fully the understanding or even description that Ezekiel can offer us. Now, out of this same spinning wheel, the glory fire of God, there are coals being taken out, used to purify the people. We continue in verse 9. I looked and I saw beside the cherubim four wheels, one beside each of the cherubim. The wheels sparkled like chrysolite. As for their appearance, the four of them looked alike. Each was like a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the cherubim faced. The wheels did not turn about as the cherubim went. The cherubim went in whatever direction the head faced without turning as they went. Their entire bodies, including their backs, their hands, and their wings, were completely full of eyes, as were their four wheels. I heard the wheels being called the whirling wheels. Each of the cherubim had four faces. One face was that of a cherub, the second the face of a man, the third the face of a lion, and the fourth the face of an eagle. Then the cherubim rose upward, these were the living creatures I had seen by the Kebar River. When the cherubim moved, the wheels beside them moved, and when the cherubim spread their wings to rise from the ground, the wheels did not leave their side. When the cherubim stood still, they also stood still. And when the cherubim rose, they rose with them, because the spirit of the living creatures was in them. So again, this vision is much like the vision in chapter 1, when Ezekiel's by the Kebar River and has that vision of the wheel turning within the wheel with the bright glory of God, these winged creatures with faces of different human as well as animal images showing forth that the glory of God is just beyond our understanding and beyond anything we can wrap our heads around. We 
continue in verse 18. Then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped over the cherubim. When I watched, the cherubim spread their wings and rose from the ground, and as they went, the wheels went with them. They stopped at the entrance to the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. These were the living creatures I had seen beneath the God of Israel by the Kebar River, and I realized that they were cherubim. Each had four faces and four wings, and under their wings was what looked like the hands of a man. Their faces had the same appearance as those I had seen by the Kebar River. Each one went straight ahead. So this vision of the glory of God with all these supernatural creatures and supernatural events, this vision that Ezekiel receives shows God leaving the temple, leaving the dwelling place built for God, the place where God has been worshipped for 400 years, the temple built by King Solomon, God is now leaving that temple and following the people into exile. God is no longer trapped in this house, in this temple. God, as God has always been, is free to move. Just as during the Exodus, the tabernacle was built and then rebuilt and moved and rebuilt again as the people journeyed through the wilderness for 40 years to worship God in this tabernacle that was immovable because God could move with the people. Now God is leaving the temple which is going to be destroyed by the Babylonians. And God is moving, going where the people are, going where the people needs God. God is not trapped in this temple. God is free to move about wherever God's people need God. Another message of hope in the midst of all this destruction, the sin, and the attacks. Thank you for joining me again for this Bible study, for our journey through the book of Ezekiel a priest and prophet speaking God's word to people who are in isolation, outside of their land, separated from all that's familiar, dealing with the burden of their sin, dealing with real disaster, and having no control over their circumstance. Maybe some of this is resonating with what our life is like today. But amongst all this disaster and separation, there's also this amazing message of hope that God still goes with us. Thank you, stay well, and hopefully I will see you soon.